Greetings, friends. In the last video, I explained that legalistic salvation consists of substituting the extra merits of one person or oneself to cancel out the demerits of another person or oneself. So the beneficiary of the uh, merits avoids punishments. All teachers of this doctrine required was to believe in the transaction, merit in place of demerit. Such legalism narrowly defined is what Paul meant by under law. Actually, it was a rabbinic tradition and not God's Torah to believe in this doctrine. So now I will explain how Messiah's death on account of our sins is not like this. Scripture tells us that Messiah died as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 26-28 It is not so among you. But whoever may be wishing to become great among you will be your servant, and whoever may be wishing to be first among you will be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6 says, For there is one Almighty and one Mediator also between the Almighty and men, the man, the anointed Yeshua, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony born in their appointed times. Isaiah says, And those being ransomed of Yahweh shall return, and they will have come to Zion with rejoicing shouts and everlasting joy upon their heads. Scripture also refers to the ransom as a price and being bought. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, Because you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify the Almighty in your body. Scripture also says where we are ransomed from. Hosea 13.14 says, From the hand of the grave I will ransom them. From death I will redeem them. Where are your plagues, death? Where is your destruction, grave? Pity is hidden from my eyes. Revelation 5 9 says we were ransomed, quote, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Unquote. Scripture also says how we were sold in the first place. Judges 2 14 says, and he had sold them into the hand of their enemies. The same or a similar thought also occurs in Judges 3 8, 4 2, 10 7 and 1 Samuel 12, 9. The Almighty sums it up in Isaiah. Behold, into your iniquities you have been sold, and into your transgressions your mother has been sent. Why have I come, and there is no man? I have called, and there is no answer. Has my hand been shortened beyond ransoming? Isaiah 51. We were sold to our enemies because of our transgressions. While we were unrepentant and in our iniquities, the nations had the right to threaten condemnation upon us, because they were the Almighty's instrument of judgment. They held the power of the grave over us. But as soon as we repent of our transgressions, then the nations lose the right to any longer threaten condemnation upon us. The Almighty forgives us when we repent and therefore the nations may not make good on their threat of condemnation, of a death for iniquity, for which there is no forgiveness. When we repent, he rescinds the right of the nation to contemn. He cancels their mandate right then, though the nations still illegally attempt to condemn. What was legal before is illegal after repentance, after we return to holding faithful to the Almighty to Messiah Yeshua. To make our release from condemnation plain, Messiah offered himself as a ransom to make it plain that while wickedness was still demanding payment, he would ransom us from their threat of condemnation. From the hand of the grave, which is the power of the grave. Messiah paid our ransom price. Now a ransom is paid to a counterparty, acting in bad faith, attempting to seize and hold what does not belong to them. The evil counterparty does no favors. It demands payment. 
But in view of the Father's forgiveness, the demand is illegitimate and illegal. To make our forgiveness plain and clear, the Father consented to give a ransom to show that their legal claim was no longer valid. The soul being ransomed is forgiven the penalty which the forces of condemnation keep threatening. The ransomer instructs us in two things. One, the great cost of getting us back, and second, in the illegitimacy of the forces of condemnation, trying to collect the penalty that was against us, that has been wiped out by forgiveness. Therefore, Messiah died the first death, which they thought would condemn him, but Messiah was innocent. He was the ransom for many. This they did not realize, and therefore he escaped from the grave on the third day. And the enemy, final death or condemnation, was left unsatisfied and denied its illegal attempt to execute strict justice against us on account of our sins, because the Almighty had already forgiven them in view of our repentance. He gave Messiah as a ransom to prove it, and then he delivered his ransom from the power of death, from the hand of the grave, from final condemnation. From death I will redeem them. Where are your plagues, death? Where is your destruction, grave? Pity is hidden from my eyes. Death was not allowed to condemn Messiah. It was not allowed to destroy him. Even his body did not see decay. The Father had no pity on death and no regard for its claims after our repentance and forgiveness. The hands seeking Messiah's condemnation were denied their illegal attempt. Instead, he ransomed us. Then he escaped. He rose again to rejoin the people whom he had ransomed. Only the first death happened. Condemnation was denied. Now we have seen this, that is, that we have seen Messiah ransoming us. Even though we may suffer the first death also, it is plain that we are ransomed from the second death, from condemnation. We will be raised as he was raised. Therefore, if you repent of your sins, the Father will forgive your sins, and his ransom will rescue you from condemnation just as the Father rescued him from it. Now, friends, I told you all this first because now I'm going to expose the false gospel. We have been caught up in the language of the false gospel for so long that we think it is normal, that it is legal, that it may be taken for granted. But it was crafted in a den of lawlessness. Its turn of phrase and soundbite theology cannot be found in Scripture. Nowhere will we find it. Any misinterpretations we will find, but we will not find this kind of language. Do you want to know why Messiah died? He let himself be victimized by the evil doings of men to show the cost of sin to the Father and to the Son. He let himself be victimized by the evil doings of evil men to show the cost of sin to the Father and to the Son. He was grieved in spirit even in the days of Noah. He gave a promise and did not execute condemnation on the sons of men, hoping that some of them would repent. But while waiting, the cost that man's sin exacted from God was terrible. The father suffered in his spirit, as did his son. The ransoming death of the son, therefore, is just a small measure, a small demonstration of the terrible spiritual cost that sin exacts in heaven and that sin exacted from other people while God waited for people to repent. The wicked authorities acted on behalf of all transgressors, that is, the wicked authorities who put Yeshua to death. They acted on behalf of all transgressors, showing themselves what all our sins do to the Almighty. In his love and long-suffering, the Father offered his Son, and the Son agreed to show us what our sin does and will do if we do not repent. Okay, now to the false gospel. In the last video, I explained how Christianity put itself under the law, which is to say, a good many view salvation as a matter of getting Christ's merits recorded onto their personal balance sheets in heaven. Of course, this is not their own personal works which are being used to pay for forgiveness, but it is in principle the same. Works are being used to balance the books, and for no other reason 
and that a legal deficit should not appear in their accounts. Meanwhile, Christians proceed to live lives of sin, believing the record book is whitewashed with righteousness. They believe this happens when they believe in Christ. But the scriptures say something different. James 2.21-24 through 24 says, Was not Abraham our father counted righteous by works when he offered up Yitzhak his son on the altar? You see that the faithfulness was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faithfulness is completed. And the text was fulfilled which says, And Abraham had held faithful in Yahweh, and he had been counting it to him as righteousness. And he was called the beloved of the Almighty. You see then that a man is made righteous by works and not by faith alone. So you see, it was Abraham's faithfulness that was being acknowledged as righteousness and not merits put into his account by a third party. Nor can Abraham put merits into the accounts of his descendants as the rabbis taught. The false gospel is a combination of two things. First, they explain that the atonement means that Christ suffered a strict wrath of God as a substitute, and then to satisfy the reparations of a strict justice, the righteousness of Christ was written into the balance seat, and then to satisfy the reparations end of strict justice, that is a requirement for a positive compensation to rectify all the losses caused by sin, the righteousness of Christ was written into the balance sheet. Then God is assumed to leave them alone and not judge them. This procedure is the same as a legal acquittal by merits. The only difference is a doctrine of transference of merit and sin, a doctrine inherited from Judaism. The principle they teach is that satisfaction of a penalty can be transferred from one person to another, and that righteousness can be transferred from one person to another. After the transfers are made, then they say there is no longer any legal basis for condemnation on the person benefiting from the transfer. The problem with this gospel is that it is not forgiveness. It is inherently lawless. It is, in fact, the gospel according to Satan and represents the Father as Satan wants him represented, as always punishing every sin with strict justice, with complete vengeance and wrath, accepting innocent life as payment for the guilty. They have made of the Father a false image in their hearts. They have reduced him to the status of pagan gods who statistically distribute their blessings after worshippers spill innocent blood. So what is the true good news? The scripture states, And they will have declared righteous the righteous, and they will have declared evil the evil. Deuteronomy 25.1 Also it says, I, meaning God, I will not declare the wicked righteous. Exodus 23.7 According to these texts, neither just judges nor the Almighty may allow the change of verdicts based on transferring guilt or innocence from one party to another. For this reason, a good deal of Christian doctrine is legalistic heresy. The law does not allow the transference of guilt or righteousness to the opposite party. Is there in Scripture any text that says Messiah took a justly assigned punishment or paid a due sin penalty? The Scriptures say anything more than that he suffered from our sins. Does it say anything more than that he died as a ransom for our sins? Does it say anything more than that he paid the price of ransom? No, it never does. Nowhere does Scripture say the threat of condemnation was satisfied. And many Christians are stunned to discover when they start reading the Bible that there is no language speaking of this. The cup Messiah drank is a cup of suffering, not wrath. His disciples drank the same cup. He became a curse in the sight of the people. But he was only thought to be accursed. He was not accursed of God because he did not deserve death. These kinds of idioms are only being interpreted through a lens of false theology. 
to suggest that the Messiah received the condemnation of God. I tell you, transferring guilt and righteousness is anathema to the word of the Almighty. That kind of corruption is even worse than the claim that Messiah rose from the dead on Sunday. Let me take a break here to offer you a free resource available at worldwidewebstorahtimes.org. See the order page, linked below and probably posted on the screen too. See the order page and you will find at the beginning of it a free copy of the book of John taken from the Good News of Messiah. You can click the download link to get a free copy of Yochanan from the Good News of Messiah. I laid the foundation in an earlier video for correcting the translation of the word believe, to hold faithful, to, to hold faithful to Messiah. It is necessary to repent and pledge faithfulness to Messiah, to hold faithful to him, to be given forgiveness, to be ransomed by his death from the threat of condemnation. Reading the book of Yochanan, you will see many illustrations of how holding faithful to Messiah works in the context. So now, let's move on. Earlier, I quoted many of the ransom texts. Here are the references. The Father is giving his Son as a ransom. Clearly, this means the Father is not getting paid for anything. He is, in fact, making the payment. A ransom payment, by nature, is not satisfaction of strict justice. It is, in fact, the payment of a price to a party or entity with an illegitimate claim in order to secure the release of a person. Surely, since we have seen who the counterparties are that are attempting to condemn the repentant and faithful, we should regard the claim to execute the right as now illegal. I should not fail here to point out the greatest counterparty that is trying to condemn you, false religion. Christianity is at the top of the list here because most of them are quick to condemn anyone who in the least wants to be faithful to Messiah by keeping his Sabbath and his other appointed times. Messiah Yeshua has ransomed us from their condemnation. Fear not, they will not succeed in exacting an illegitimate condemnation. The Father has forgiven they are the ones turning Messiah's ransom into their own legalistic folly. The counterparty for the ransom, purchase, is death and the grave. Hosea 13.14 says, From the hand of the grave I will ransom them. From death I will redeem them. Where are your plagues? Death. Where is your destruction? Grave. Pity is hidden from my eyes. The counterparty may also be described as from men, or from the earth, or from every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. It may be described as nations keeping Israel in exile, or as from Satan, or from his powers. The common denominator is that all these forces are seeking to condemn the faithful who are being ransomed. All these forces are acting on the behalf of death. The question then is, does death have the right to execute condemnation? The answer is fairly straightforward. The answer is yes, if the person under threat is unrepentant and does not seek forgiveness. The Almighty did turn a greater part of the human race over to these forces to make good on the threat of condemnation, because man rebelled against him. But when Adam sinned, the death sentence applied was not condemnation. It was physical death, the first death. A promise was given to man if he did not follow the serpent, so really the first death is physical death with the threat of it being turned into death as, as condemnation, if man does not repent. If he repents, then death by condemnation is forgiven. Another name for death by condemnation is either permanent death or the second death. This is the death that all the forces from which we are getting ransomed seek to execute. Okay. So I have to clear up some loose ends here. When the Almighty enters into judgment, or into the judgment of a sinner, he can acquit, or he can condemn, or he can pardon. A pardon does not violate the law's demand to find the sinner guilty. A pardon only means that a sentence will be forgiven. 
condemnation will not be exacted. Please note that most versions mistranslate Deuteronomy 25.1 as condemning the guilty. But this is not what it says. It says making wicked the wicked. It uses the same word twice. The wicked person is wicked. He is not condemned while he stands before the judge. He gets condemned if a sentence is carried out. Whether to sentence or not is at the discretion of the judge. The Torah has sentencing guidelines, but the Almighty may intervene and overrule the guidelines if he desires to show mercy, as he did with King David. In the case that the wicked man repents, the Almighty in his righteousness decides the outcome of justice should be forgiveness and not strict justice. The judge may justify his case either by strict justice or by forgiving justice. Both outcomes are justice, but the circumstances determine which. If the person repents and seeks mercy, then forgiving justice will be the result. In order to demonstrate his forgiveness, a ransom in blood is required. This is quite graphic, but it illustrates this basic point. As the judge forgives, death and the grave lose the right to threaten the faithful with condemnation. But in man's mind, death and the grave do not give up so easily. The ransom is to show us that the forces threatening our death must and will give up their claim, which now must be shown to be illegal. Therefore, death is allowed to take an innocent victim. Now, I should explain here the difference between the animal atonement and Messiah's atonement. Generally, non-serious sins, i.e. sins of ignorance, or of the unavoidable circumstance, do not bring one under the threat of condemnation. That is, these sins do not lead to the condemnation death of the one who commits the error. This is because the heart was upright, but the animal offering is required nonetheless to show that even unwitting errors harm the innocent, and therefore the error incurs the threat of temporal consequences or sufferings for the folly of the heir. Like Job's three friends who spoke in ignorance, an animal offering was sufficient to demonstrate their ransom from the threat of temporal punishment, which was forgiven after Job prayed for them. Messiah's offering is on a different level. Transgression and iniquity refer to serious sins which get us sold into slavery under the threat of condemnation. In this case, the ransom is Messiah. When the transgressor repents, the ransom is given to compel death to release the sinner from the threat of condemnation. As in all ransom cases, the claim of death for a right to legally condemn is no longer valid. Like Israel was sold into the hand of its enemies for transgression, so the Almighty has a right to ransom if they repent. The use of the ransom implicitly denies continued legality to the enemies holding a threat of condemnation over Israel. So the enemy, death, is unable to exact condemnation against the faithful being delivered or being rescued. But meanwhile, death, the enemy, has taken Messiah and wishes to condemn him. The authorities sought to execute Messiah with condemning death, but they were mistaken because he was innocent. He was the ransom for the people, as Caiaphas was made to say. For this reason, Messiah escaped from death's threat of condemnation, which is to say, the second death. He escaped from death by resurrection. It was unable to hold him. Therefore, he did not satisfy a demand for strict justice, even by the theory of substitution. Messiah is an instruction for us of the Father's forgiveness. In the Hebrew, from Isaiah 53, 5, he was a Musar Shalomenu Alayo, a instruction of our peace upon us, peace referring to forgiveness. He was an instruction or demonstration. Upon our repentance, the forces of condemnation have their rights to make good on the threat of condemnation stripped away. The powers below are disarmed. The sentences against us are wiped out through forgiveness, and the powers have no right to execute condemnation, whether death, men, 
the grave, the earth, or any nation or people. That is, death doesn't have the right to use any of these various means to carry out the sentence. To show this, the father rescued his son from final death at their hands. For this reason, repentance and a return to holding faithful to the Almighty is necessary to be worthy of Messiah's ransom. No merits are required for the forgiveness of transgressions. They are simply forgiven, and the ransom is there to prove it. Messiah only suffers to show us the cost of sin, to show us the cost to the Father, not to pay any retributive penalty of divine wrath. The Almighty has chosen to forsake strict justice by wrath for his faithful ones. He has decided for forgiving justice. We only need to walk in him, forsaking our sins. I will close with 2 Thessalonians 1.5. Let's start in verse 4, since it starts at the beginning of a sentence. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the assemblies of the Almighty, for your patient endurance and faithfulness in the midst of all your persecutions and inflictions, which you endure, which are a plain indication of the Almighty's righteous judgment, to the end that you should be found worthy of the kingdom of the Almighty, for which indeed you are suffering. Thank you for listening.